The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. Well, what a joy today to have Ed Stetzer with us. Ed is uh, really a pastor that I think of as someone who's cross-denominationally connected. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I like to be, yep. Mm -hmm. Ed uh, is a regular contributor for Christianity Today and is the interim pastor at, I think you said it was the oldest megachurch in the Oldest America. extant megachurch, still existing megachurch in the yeah, country. In like the world, actually in the world. Years. 100 years, 150 Moody years old. Church Moody in Church in Chicago. Yeah. And he's flown all the way out here to preach to our church today and to preach to the Hour of Power on a subject that I think troubles a lot of us. And that is the, the divisiveness the outrage, the, the contempt that's happening between people who disagree, particularly politically, but also within our own faith, and how we engage civilly with one another in our disagreements. And uh, so we're gonna, he's gonna preach on that today, but would you welcome with me Ed Stetzer. Thank Hi, you so Ed. much. Good to be here. Well, thank you. And it is great to be here with you. If you have a Bible, you can take it out and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it's, uh, we do live in a divided time. Increasingly, people are turning the volume up to 11 and being very uh, vocal and upset and angry and divisive. Outrage has sort of been the theme of our day. It's not just politics, but it certainly includes politics. It's sometimes in families, at workplaces, uh, with neighbors and more. The question is, is how do we live in the midst of these divided times? Well, four things. Number one is we get a new perspective. Let's look here at what the Bible says. It says this in verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. We look closely, it says from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, which is a reminder that now we look at people differently because of who we are in Christ. We kind of have a different look at the world. We have a different look at people. We know, for example, people are made in the image of God, worthy of dignity and respect because we have a different look because of this new life we have in Christ. So now, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. But it doesn't end there. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. So don't miss that what's going on here is if they're tied in together. It says, therefore. Whenever there's a therefore in the Bible, you want to ask, what's it there for? Well, in this case, it's connecting the two verses, right? So we got this new look. Now, how do we get this new look? Well, because we have this new life. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, there's new creation. We've been made new in Christ. So now, because we've got a new life, we're going to have a new look. We're going to have new lenses through which we see the world. Part of it we might understand that the world's pretty broken. I mean, think about 1 Corinthians 7.31 actually says the world, the present form of this world, is passing away. So if the world's passing away, we ought not to be shocked or surprised that there's division and fracture and brokenness and outrage. We've got to ask, how do we live as Christians in the age of outrage? How do we bring our best when the world is at its worst? Now, when we think about the moment we're in, it kind of remind us in many ways of the mission we're on. How do we see things differently, right? Don't miss it, right? Got this new life in Christ. Got this new look through which we see the world. Maybe some new lenses through which we see these things. Now, let me explain a little more about uh, lenses. I have, I have three daughters. They're all, uh, well, they're, they're, they're 14, they're 16, and 20, and 20, which is both a statement of truth and a prayer request at the same time. Um, <laughs> Love my daughters, girls, girls are amazing, but they have so many words. But anyway, that's another story for another, <laughs> another day. Um, so, but my, my daughters are uh, wonderful and amazing. My youngest daughter uh, seems that she inherited her father's eyes. You may notice that I wear glasses, and so, um, so I, I wear glasses because I, I need to. And so it wasn't that long ago, last year, she came home from the eye doctor, and we, uh, Donna, my wife, shared with me that Caitlin's gonna have to get glasses, okay. Well, so, so, I, so I, I kind of wanted to comfort her, and so, because when I was a kid, wearing glasses was something that got you made fun of, right? They called me four eyes, 
when I was a kid. I had these, and you know, to be fair, I had the big glasses and the eye patch. I mean, I had the whole deal. And so, but they made fun of me. And so I was a little concerned. I don't want Caitlin to be made fun of. So I said, honey, honey I'm sorry. And she said, what do you mean you're sorry? Um, I said, well, you have to wear glasses. Yeah, that's cool now, she said. <laughs> I said, she said, some kids in middle school, they're actually going to the eye place and buying glasses without prescriptions because they're that cool. And I thought to myself, I was born at the wrong time. <laughs> uh, deeply disappointed that when I was a kid, that was not cool. Uh, and it's so many things that now, like comic books. I read comic books as a kid because I was a nerd. Now they're blockbuster films and all the cool people do that. So something is tragically wrong with my birth year, but that's another story <laughs> for another day. But lenses we use. So I don't wear glasses though for fashion. I wear glasses for seeing. Uh, I want to see you when I talk to you. I want to see my, my wife, Donna. I want to see my girls. I want to see. But the reality is, is sometimes classes sort of define us. And it, it's, it's, it's interesting because it came up at the Moody Church where, um, where, where Bobby mentioned that I've been serving. So I've been the uh, interim teaching pastor there for uh, two years, which is longer than two of their actual pastors were the pastor of that church. So it's been a long, <laughs> been a long interim. And a wonderful, though, it's a wonderful church there in Chicago, a historic, founded by uh, D.L. Moody, um, and a beautiful sanctuary, just a wonderful place. It's not the most comfortable seats. Warren Wearsby, one of the former pastors, used to say, come on in, grab a seat, any seat, they are all equally uncomfortable. So if you've ever <laughs> been to Moody Church, you've experienced that. But one of the things that when you're in this church, it's been around 150 years, that's very well known by its former pastors, the most recent pastor, Erwin Lutzer, has recently uh, stepped into a role as pastor emeritus while they're looking for uh, a new pastor. But, but it's kind of historic. So people listen on the radio. Actually, Pastor Lutzer is still the voice of Moody Church on the radio because I'm the interim. I'm not the radio. So people come every week to church and come up to me and thank me for the message they heard me do on the radio. So they actually think I'm Pastor Lutzer. But we sort of Lutzer, Stetzer. So I just go with it and I say, you're so welcome. I hope you enjoyed that. Shake their hands and all is good. Well, one of the things, though, when you have so many people who've kind of cycled in and out of the church um, over the years, you have hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people who kind of have this stake in the church, and they send letters, right? Sometimes they're wonderful letters, sometimes not so much, but they send letters, and they'll express an idea or an opinion, and so I read some of them, particularly the signed ones, and uh, here's one that I, uh, that I recently received that I thought I'd share with you relates to our topic. Here it is. I mean, this is unedited. I just took a screenshot on my phone. I edited out the, uh, the, the so the two paragraphs here are not edited, but I edited out the dear pastor and the, and the signature. He did sign it. Here's what he said. He said, I listened to your August 13th sermon at Moody Church Online. After listening to it once, which I think that's a good sign. That means he listened more than once. I listened again. Okay, great. Because I was awestruck getting better with the number of times you adjusted your glasses while preaching. So the second, it was not what I was going for with the awestruck. So the second time I listened, I saw in the first 36 minutes of your sermon, you adjusted your glasses 74 times. <laughs> and then you took them off. So I counted no further. <laughs> then he goes, I guess, to get a calculator, because it says this was an average of once every 30 seconds. <laughs> but keep in mind, this was an incomplete count because some of the time scripture or your sermon was on the screen and I could not see you. <laughs> I tell you this in Christian love. They all say that at some point in the letter. <laughs> because I know that you're interested in being aware of anything that may distract listeners from hearing what you are preaching, teaching. So I hope you will accept this knowing that I want your ministry for Christ to be as effective as possible. Now, I believe this guy wants to help me. I actually made changes on the basis of this email. I bought a product called Nerd Wax. I put it on my glasses. It keeps them from sliding down. So I made changes, uh, but here's the reality. I don't wear glasses and I don't adjust them for fashion. I do these things for seeing. Now, I know some of you are already right now planning to count how many times I touch my glasses by the end of the message today. Let's just get that out of your heart right now focus on the message at hand. 
Because here's the thing. I want you not to miss, right? So I need glasses to see. I need lenses to see the world. But now in Christ, I've got this new life. It's given me a new look. I look and see people differently now. This new look involves some supernatural lenses. And here's the thing I don't want you to miss. They slip too. Because I adjust my glasses because they slide down my nose and the focal length gets off and I can't see. And so I, I put them back. But here's what I want you to miss, right? In the world in which we live, when it's so easy to get distracted and out of focus, we've got to adjust the lenses. That's why Paul even writes this. Why would Paul tell us this if it was automatically evident that we're already seeing the world, not in a worldly way, but through the lenses of our new life in Christ? Here's why. Because he's reminding us because they were not. And 2,000 years later, it's easy for us to see the world through the lenses of things other than our new life in Christ. Some people are being discipled by their cable news channel. Some people are being spiritually shaped by their social media feed. And the end result is they look just like everyone else in the world when Jesus calls us to a different and a better way. So why does that matter? Well, it matters because as Christians, we need to look through a new lens because we've received a new life that's given us a new look. And if you want to step through the outrage and the fracturing in our world, you have to do so by representing Jesus and his kingdom well. So number one, we get a new perspective. Number two, sent on a mission of reconciliation. Let's continue to look at the text. It says, now everything is from God. It's referring to that which is before. Now everything is from God. All this is from God, right? It says, who, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Don't miss those two words in there. Reconciled us, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It goes on and it says that is like in Christ, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. It's actually a double parallel. It kind of talks about how God reconciled us to himself, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Then there's a parallel of it, a repeat. It says, reconciling the world to himself in Christ, committed to us the message of reconciliation. Don't you miss this, right? This is tied together. It begins with now all this is from God. So that which comes before, the new life, which given us a new look, which gives us some new lenses through which to see the world, supernatural lenses that need adjusting because sometimes we get caught up in the world's ways. But here we are sent on a mission of reconciliation. You are sent, I am sent on a mission of reconciliation. That implies some things that really matter. It's, it implies for us that people without Christ need to be reconciled to God through Christ. It, it tells us that we have been reconciled to God through Christ if we're followers of Jesus, right? We've been born again by the power of the gospel. We're living now new life in Christ. Not perfect. Lenses need adjusting regularly, but we have been reconciled to God, and now we're sent as agents of reconciliation in the world. So your job and my job then is to be in the midst of a broken and fractured and outraged world, but to represent reconciliation in the name of Jesus. Now that reconciliation will be uh, men and women to God. It also means we'll minister his kingdom and perhaps bring some reconciliation in the midst of the outrage and the brokenness that is all around us as well. You know, I, I just had the privilege of holding the Billy Graham chair at Wheaton College. I serve the executive director of the Billy Graham Center. And of course, this year, uh, uh, Mr. Graham went on to be uh, with the Lord. And of course, you know that Mr. Graham had a connection here as well. The, the, the words, hour of power, are actually suggested first by Mr. Graham and then named this program many, many years ago. But, but Mr. Graham went on to be with the Lord, and in doing so, it's it kind of changed a lot of our conversation for just a little while in our country. People looked at him and said, this was a guy who represented Jesus and his kingdom well, a winsome voice for the gospel. Well, but why? Because he saw himself as, a, as an agent of reconciliation. Um, when he died, um, we, I was asked within just a little bit of time to write articles for both the USA Today and CNN. And I did. And I asked them, how, how overt can I be about his message? And they said, be all in. One of the articles was called, What Billy Graham Would Want You to Know About Him. And one of the things was, is Billy Graham was famous. That's not what he would want you to know. Billy Graham certainly was famous. He's uh, one of the most well-known figures ever. Matter of fact, he will probably be the, as of now, he's the person most named as the most admired person in America. Uh, probably no one will ever beat that record because how many times he was on there and how much our country is divided now. But he's certainly uh, deeply admired. But ultimately, he saw himself as reconciled to God 
and being an agent of reconciliation. I remember I was in Florida when I heard the news that he had gone on to uh, be with the Lord. And the day before, Donna, my wife, and I went down. I was speaking at an event in Florida. And uh, when you live in Chicago and it's uh, cold, Donna always wants to go with me when it's an event in Florida. So we went together. We got into, uh, when we got into our car, and when we got into our car, we take, we're taking Uber, and the Uber driver, Uber drivers tend to be very nice because they're trying to earn that Magical Five rating. Uh, I'm trying to earn the Magical Five rating in return, so I'm being nice to them as well. Very important, my Uber rating. And so I get in the car, and Jane starts talking to Donna and me. She says, like, sometimes Uber drivers will, listen, I got a bottle of water if you'd like it, if you need to charge your phone, I got an adapter. Take anything you'd like in the middle. And one of the things in the middle was a little green, well, I'm not sure it was green, I don't remember now, but I'm remembering like a Gideon Bible. And so Donna kind of smiled at me because it's, I've never gotten an Uber where one of the options was a Bible. And so um, we started driving to the airport and Jane started having a conversation with us and moving that conversation towards spiritual things. Donna keeps looking over at me, smiling. You know, Jane's like, well, how long you lived here? Well, a couple of years. And she asks five or six different questions and she gets closer and closer to asking kind of spiritual questions. So tell me, and I don't remember her exact words, but I mean, tell me, do you have any like church engagement or involvement? She's about to kind of land the plane and share the gospel with me. And Donna's smiling because I'm not saying anything much. And, and Donna, at one point, she says that, she turns to me and says, you need to tell her. And I said, Jane, just so you know, I'm actually, I, I, I hold the Billy Graham chair at Wheaton College. I teach evangelism and you are doing great. And she laughed and we laughed and actually recorded her, an interview with her that I later published in Christianity Today uh, called Jane the Uber Driver. Jane the Uber Driver. Um, you can find that quite easily. It got picked up by a lot of different outlets. But so fast, uh, fast forward, we hear that Mr. Graham has passed and oh, I don't even know. It was a little while later. We were in Charlotte for the funeral and, and uh, you know, the, the world gathered, right? Uh, he, Mr. Graham lied, uh, was, was in the Capitol Rotunda, uh, which the last person who had that honor was actually Rosa Parks. Um, presidents went to visit him there, pre and, and funeral as well. And so while at the funeral, though, all the reporters were there. So a reporter from a national newspaper, you know the name, came up to me and said, uh, Dr. Stetzer, who is the next Billy Graham? And you know, people wonder, and people, you know, is it so-and-so? And nobody really claims that. Nobody says, I'm the next Billy Graham. There's organizational leaders, there's, there's people that other people say are the next Billy Graham, but nobody to my knowledge actually says, I'm the next Billy Graham. But I was ready. She said, uh, the reporter said, who's the next Billy Graham? And I said, Jane the Uber driver is. <laughs> and she looked at me with a puzzled look and I kind of explained. It didn't make the story, but, uh, but here's the thing I don't want you to miss, right? Jane knew that she's been sent on a mission of reconciliation. She was, because of the joy of being reconciled with Christ, she's actually a realtor. She works in and around the community where we live. And her, her kid said, you should go drive Uber when you don't have a, a house to show. You like that, you like to talk to people. And she said, and I get to share the gospel with them. And so Jane drives around picking up people so she can tell them about Jesus. And here's the reality I don't want you to miss. She knows she's sent on a mission of reconciliation, but so are you if you're a follower of Jesus. We've been reconciled and sent on a mission of reconciliation. So number one, we get a new perspective, new life, new look, new lenses. Number two, we're sent on a mission of reconciliation. Number three, representing Jesus and his kingdom. Let's look at verse 20. It says, we are ambassadors, we are therefore ambassadors, we're Christ's ambassadors, right? As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So this passage here is, speaks really, Paul's actually speaking about himself and the kind of band of missionaries that are with him. He's defending his apostleship, but for 2,000 years, Christians have applied this to themselves. I think it's appropriate to do so because we are ambassadors for Christ. Why? Because that's our primary focus, right? Our primary focus is not a politician or a party or an elected official. We're, we're, the only person we should be all in for is Jesus, and the only kingdom that should be our greatest priority is his kingdom. And can I tell you, when that's the truth, it shapes how you respond to other people. Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 33. He said, seek first. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. When Christians are primarily focused on the values and the importance of the kingdom of God, it changes everything about how they relate to others. 
You say, Ed, I just think I should be able to say whatever I want. I, it's a free country. I can say whatever I want. And I can put it on social media or we're coming up on the holidays. I can say it at Thanksgiving dinner. I can say it at Christmas, whatever I want. I'm just being frank. Can I tell you, unless your name's Frank, stop. <laughs> and Frank, be Christ-like as well. Because it's not driven by your rights. It's driven by Jesus' kingdom. Now, number four and Finally, and I'll close with this. You know what it means when a guest speaker says, I'll close with this? Absolutely nothing, <laughs> just so you know. But I will. Number one, we get a new perspective. Number two, sent on a mission of reconciliation. Number three, representing Jesus and his kingdom. Number four, because of the cross. Now, it's interesting because it almost seems like Paul stepped away for a moment and came back with a new thought. Here's what it says. God made him who had no sin. Let's look at that closely so you don't miss it. God made him who had no sin. That's God made Jesus, him who had no sin. God made Jesus to be sin for us so that in him, don't miss those in hims, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now this verse is very theological. It's actually a theological principle at work here called imputation. I want you to say that word out loud with me. Are you ready? Imputation. Let's do it again imputation. Now, I'm going to explain it because I believe if you can learn to order coffee at Starbucks, you can learn some theological words at church. I don't know a venti latte from an imputation, but I'll explain what imputation is. My wife goes to Starbucks. I just buy coffee for her because I don't drink it. But the, the imputation is it's from the first century. It's a banking term. It's like a deposit, right? And so here's the thing. We were born, right? We were born and we inherited a sin nature. It was imputed to us. So we were sinners by nature and by choice, but that didn't end there. Thank God the story didn't end there. You see, on the cross, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. On the cross, Jesus, remember when he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Remember when he sweat blood in the garden? Why? Because on the cross, he knew he wasn't just dying. He was dying, not just dying for our sin, but literally he was made sin for us. So when Jesus died on the cross for our sin and in our place, he took my place, he took the penalty for my sin, and in the process of doing so, my sin as a Christian was imputed to Jesus, deposited in him. But that's not the end of the verse. Here's where it gets even great, right? It goes on and says this. It says, right, gonna lay this out for us. It says, so that we might become... Don't miss the second part of it. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. There's one more imputation. His righteousness has now been imputed to us. So if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus, the God the Father doesn't look down and see your sin. He sees Jesus' righteousness. And he sees the forgiveness and the grace. He sees the righteousness of his son because his righteousness has been imputed to you if you're a follower of Jesus. Now, that has all kinds of implications. If you're not a follower of Jesus today, you can trust and follow him. Receive that forgiveness of sin, be changed, and then become this kind of person who's, who gets a new perspective, sent on a mission of reconciliation, representing Jesus and his kingdom because of the cross. But the question is here, why is this at the end of this passage? Because it's such a different feel to it. Here, but here's why. It is the motivation for everything that precedes it. See why? Because he made the one who knew no sin to be sin for us. So Jesus died a sinner's death. He wasn't a sinner, but he died a sinner's death so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in him. And now as I get to walk in the fullness of the forgiveness and the grace and the righteousness and the beauty of the gospel and the filling of the spirit, now I can, not just I can, I should and must live differently. To acknowledge I've got a new life that's given me a new look, some new lenses through which I see the world. That means I'm going to engage differently because I'm representing Jesus and his kingdom now. Right? So I'm on a mission of reconciliation because I've been reconciled. I'm sharing that with others, the good news of the gospel, and I'm bringing reconciliation to a divided world so that I can be an ambassador in the midst of it. And the end result is I do this to honor Christ because of the cross. So sisters and brothers, my encouragement to you is simple. Put on, put on those supernatural glasses when you engage your neighbors or your friends or your family or on social media. Work towards reconciliation with God and with others 
Seek to represent Jesus and his kingdom and do so because of what Christ has done for you on the cross. Would you pray with me? Father, by your grace and your goodness, you have redeemed us and called us by name. You've sent us on a mission in the midst of brokenness and outrage. Father, help us to be Christians in the age of outrage who bring our best when the world is at its worst. Help us not to justify engaging in worldly means to actually receive some sort of spiritual benefit, Lord, but let our hearts and our lives be shaped by the gospel, be instructed by the word of God, be empowered by the spirit, so that the way we live might not burn bridges with our neighbors and people with whom we disagree, but might build them, and ultimately your name and your fame would be more widely known. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen and amen. Thanks for the opportunity to share with you. God bless. Hannah and I are so happy you've joined us in worship today. We hope that you've found incredible hope and inspiration from our program. Here at Shepherd's Grove and Hour of Power, we truly believe that we are better together. Regardless of where on this earth God has planted us, in Him we are a family. Bobby and I want you to know that we are so grateful for your generosity to our ministry. But it's not just our ministry, it's your ministry. And none of this would be possible without you. Because of you, people all around the world are being reached with the gospel every single week, and their lives are being changed forever. As we enter into another year of His goodness, we pray that you also know that you are part of God's family. You are a beloved child of God, united by His Spirit with brothers and sisters in every nation of the world. That's right. We want you to know that you're never alone, no matter what you're facing. God has the whole world in His hands. He loves you, and so do we. Today, Bobby and Hannah would love to send you this 2019 Hope Around the World wall calendar. Each month features a beautiful photo from the United States or a country where an Hour of Power office is located, like Canada, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, and Germany. Your calendar also includes monthly scriptures and inspiration, as well as powerful testimonies from members of both our national and international Hour of Power family. Large boxes for each day of the month, perfect for writing in appointments and events, or the names of loved ones you want to pray for. Each day also includes a daily scripture reading to help you read through the Bible in one year. We want this 12-month calendar to remind you how truly loved you are and how much we honor your partnership with this ministry. Call, write, or go online today and request your 2019 Hope Around the World wall calendar or asking for a generous gift of any size. Thank you for watching the Hour of Power and for your ongoing generous support to help keep this program on the air. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.